I'm Adam Twardoch and I'm a product manager at FontLab and I want to talk you today through a Python scripting in FontLab Studio 5. It's going to be three parts that I'll try to cover. First, I'll talk about Python in general. Then I'll show you some useful macros that are already existing and that can be downloaded and installed and also I'll sort of talk you through the user interface in FontLab Studio. And then finally I'm gonna try to sort of show you step by step how to how to write some simple, simple macros and also macros or scripts it's the same thing in Python and point you to uh, to some resources with the modern operating systems and new versions of Python, it's really easy to set everything up. Uh, FontLab Studio 5.1.4 uh, on the Mac and 5.2.1 on Windows are the most current versions. There are two major versions of Python. One is version 2 and the other is version 3. Python 2.7 point something is the most current version that um, uh, we'll be dealing with. It doesn't really, the last digit doesn't really matter so much, so on the most current, on macOS 10.10, uh, Python 2.7.6 is pre-installed and you don't really need to upgrade to 2.7.9, it doesn't really matter. 2.7.9 is the most current version, so if you're on Windows, um, essentially I'm going to just uh, do that quickly. If you go to python.org and go to Downloads, Windows, there are um, the Windows 2.7.9 uh, Python installers that were released uh, in December. And there are two installers, x86 and x86.64. That's important because this is the the first one x86 is the 32-bit version of Python the other x86 64 is the 64-bit version of Python and now the important thing is you always need to install the 32-bit version so Windows x86 MSI installer even if you're on 64-bit Windows so some of you may have Windows 7 64-bit or something like that or Windows 8 64-bit but even then install the 32-bit version the first installer here because that is because Py FontLab Studio 5.2.1 uh, on Windows is a 32-bit application so it needs 32-bit Python regardless of whether your system is 64 or 32-bit as I said on uh, the Mac Python is already installed and you don't really need to do anything apart from that's sort of an optional step but um, there is something called PIP or PIP the Python pa uh, Python package manager um, and that Python package manager is uh, used to install additional packages that are in the Python uh, a package repository pypi python org slash pypi that's the python package index and here there's a lot of additional packages that may be useful or you may end up needing it somehow and once you have pip it's very easy so pip comes pre-installed if you install python 279 on windows if you're on the mac that's actually fairly uh, fairly easy um, if we uh, if we go to uh, yeah that's the if if we Google for get pip the first link there is a little uh, file here in the pip installation on the pip installation website called get pip dot py what we need to do is save it somewhere for instance onto the desktop and then that's the other part uh, we need uh, terminal so terminal is by default is in the applications folder in utilities 
I need to go to my desktop, CD, desktop, sudo, sudo, python, get minus pip dot py, I type in my administrator's pass password. If I need to install an extra package, both on Windows or on the Mac, from different uh, Python packages, I I will be able to type something like pip install and the name. So then I have access to more packages more easily. Uh, GitHub is a popular place to um, source the, to, for, for, for authors to publish their source code for different scripts and packages and if I go to GitHub for instance I um, I can search GitHub I did that before for something like FontLab Python for instance and I get a number of hits those are basically or maybe FontLab macros or just FontLab for instance there, there's a number of uh, scripts that people have published that are on GitHub that you will be able to install later and uh, I'll show you parts of that installation because installing these is is a bit complicated or at least it, it needs some time to get used to. But first let's go back after we've installed Python and pip that's the two things that we need. We need to install Robofab Fontos TTX. Um, I'll get um, I get instructions written by Thomas Finney that really go step by step um, and tell you after you've you've installed Python how to install font tools, Robofab, and also two additional packages, Vanilla and Dialogkit, that are needed by uh, font tools and Robofab, or specifically by Robofab. So after that, when uh, FontLab Studio starts, uh, you get um, the properties panel should say Python is installed. If it is installed, then we're fine. Uh, then we have um, one particular toolbar called the macro toolbar, can be viewed through view, toolbars, macro. And that's where the macros will live. By default, you'll see far, far, far less entries here. But we, I have installed a couple of these free macro packages already. Uh, if I go to Finder, uh, it's a bit tricky. I, I go to my user folder, and by default, I believe on most uh, Mac OS X, the library folder is hidden. So if it is hidden, I go to go, go to folder, and type in library. Then it opens. And then I go to application support and here I find FontLab and in here in the subfolder of it Studio 5 and that's inside of the Studio 5 you have again a bunch of folders uh, data where some additional uh, whatever you put in here will kind of override or add to the the different kinds of files that FontLab Studio uses. So for instance, encodings, my custom encodings could be in here, uh, my custom kerning files, uh, standard MAM or others. Um, but the most important for now for us is the macros folder. Now the macros folder by default will have um, just um, um, a few empty folders. One of them, the most important one, this is already after I've installed some stuff. Inside macros, there is something called system, and this sort of the macros folder and the macros system folder are fairly important. And once again, inside the system folder, modules. So that's basically Studio 5. Inside there's macros, there's system, and there's modules. And I'm going to talk about modules um, a bit later. But this is sort of this is the location where uh, modules should go should you ever need to install some modules in some cases some some tools or some scripts that we can download freely from the internet will do it automatically some we have to put that stuff into the module folder mm. so that's the module folder the rest is basically a user interface for macros and now anything any folder or any 
uh, script that is put directly into the macros folder will be shown in the macros toolbar the folders will be shown here in this uh, in this first or actually second drop down menu so if if i if you have a look at this you know you you will you will notice that my you know i have adobe anchors adobe kerning adobe mm designs etc that structure is basically the same structure as the folders here in macros apart from the special folder system which doesn't show up here because the system folder um, is used uh, in, a, in, a, in a special way. Now the system folder has this modules folder that I mentioned but also has some additional uh, uh, folders and these folders anything that you put inside here will show up in special places within the FontUp Studio interface. So for example um, if I put something in the font folder then the macros that I put in here I'm gonna open a um, font here they will show up in the font window in this little context menu drop down also some additional ones that are in the same location but in the main font lab folder the one that comes with the pre-installed stuff show up here but your additional ones that you put inside your application support font lab studio 5 macro system font will show up here if you put something into the metrics uh, subfolder oh yeah they will show up in the context menu of the metrics folder so count pairs for instance is somewhere not in this custom but in the default location uh, in the metrics folder etc etc so there's there's a bunch of locations glyph for instance anything that I put in here will show up in the macros uh, pop-up of the glyph window so this way you know you can you can put instead if you have lots of macros sometimes instead of navigating through these and then running them it's much easier to uh, to have them um, to have them in this context uh, folder for instance that let's say we we all know the 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 mark the ability to mark uh, glyphs by color mm, we can do this here let's say we're gonna mark these red and we're gonna mark a bunch of other glyphs red and we're gonna mark a bunch of other glyphs red and now you know after I've worked on a font for some time I really wish that I could just simply get these selected right so I've written a little macro that allows you to do that easily you um, right click you say macro and then say select similarly marked and the glyphs that have the same mark color are selected that's the Python that's the power of Python basically great way to sort of extend easily certain functionalities not only of course in FontUp Studio because uh, Python is now used in um, pretty much all the font editors that exist uh, you know in Robofont, in Glyphs, in FontForge they all work with Python sometimes the internal structure of how you talk to your Python objects is a bit different um, but Python works everywhere pretty much for us type designers Python is, is really the, the first and most important sort of programming or scripting language that uh, that it's it's sensible to learn um, so Python uh, sorry s scripts can do a lot of uh, cool things for instance Pablo Impalari who has written a great number of free scripts has written for instance a very handy script I, I find that you know for instance one where I select two nodes and can say it's in his guidelines section uh, I can say center of two nodes I select the macro run it and it adds a guideline uh, at the center of these two nodes if I select these here it will put two guidelines in the middle of these two nodes and if I there's a bunch of others for instance center of current glyph it will add a guideline uh, at the middle of the current glyph I already mentioned the macro toolbar and the context menus but there are two other places uh, two other panels that are actually quite important one is the edit macro panel the other is the output panel 
So let's have a look at these now. I have my font here open and I'm going to open, I'm going to go to Windows panels, window panels, I'm going to open the output panel and I'm going to, I'm going to close this one and I'm going to open the edit macro panel. Basically edit macro is where you can type in your own Python code and the output panel is where Python macros can write something out. So for instance, if I say this is the very the, the basic um, sort of little program that uh, people use in all programming languages, sample program, and that's hello world. And in Python it goes like this. Print, then opening double quote or single quote, hello world, and then again the same uh, quote quotation mark, single quotation mark, the regular ones, not the smart typographic ones. And then I can also hit enter and that's my, my little macro, one line. I hit the run macro and it prints out in the output panel, hello world. I run it again, it does it again. That's a program, uh, essentially. There is um, there's, uh, an ability to open also new, start a new program, open an existing one, and save it. Um, so this is this is a little text editor, but there are much better text editors uh, where you can uh, when you can write Python that do some things more smartly. I um, am a big fan of of using on the Mac uh, the editor called Sublime Text. I will um, just open the whole macros folder, my custom macros folder in Sublime Text and it now allows me to um, to edit, change um, any kinds of preview, any kinds of macros that are already written. Um, there's another, uh, don't worry about these, this is, this is sort of, um, I've got some extra packages installed, you won't see that by default. Another one that is popular is Text Wrangler. It's free for Mac OS X. On um, Windows, I believe there's one called Notepad++ and also uh, one that I used to use uh, when I used Windows called Ultra Edit. So we have Edit Macro Output Context Menus, Macro Toolbar. Now, um, what is Python itself? And let's talk about some very basic structures. So we have, um, so Python programs are plain text files. Um, they usually have the file extension .py. Uh, Python is a case sensitive um, language. So whether you type something in uppercase or lowercase does matter. And there are uh, some basic um, elements of Python that I'm gonna talk um, talk through right now. Well, we have something called statements that are mm, something like print, uh, what I've done. It's basically commands that uh, your program tells the computer to uh, perform a certain operations. And there's, there's, a, uh, there's a number of these, not a huge one, but uh, because there are also other ways to, to tell the computer what to do, statements is the simplest one, like print. We've saw, seen that, I've said print hello world, uh, clicked on run and I got the output. Comments are important, very important. Basically comments are just a great way, if, I, if, I, if we look at this macro here, we'll see that uh, these first lines start with the hash character and Sublime Text sort of neatly um, uh, makes them gray and, and, and italicizes them. Uh, so these are, these are comments. In FontLab Studio, there's a special kind of comment and that's the first line, if it starts with hash, F, L, M, and then colon, whatever follows afterwards will be the menu name uh, that your macro uses here. So if this special comment isn't here, then FontLab Studio will display just the file name 
without the PY extension, but sometimes you may want to customize this. So this is a special comment specific to FontLab Studio. Anything REST, a line that starts with hash, similar to Adobe FDK, uh, the language is a comment, it's ignored. Now we have some, some uh, statements here, such as import for, a good text editor will highlight them as colors. And then we have, um, we have some additional elements and that's um, strings, integers, floats and lists. And uh, well, let's start, basically let's start with a string. A string, so for that I will, oh, I will actually, I will actually, um, start a new macro here, a new file. I'm going to tell Sublime Text that this is Python. And I'm going to save it right away into my macros folder as um, adamtest.py. So you can verify it's, it's here. Once I've saved a macro into my macros folder within font, the FontLab Studio structure, I can uh, I need only to do that if, if I've added a new one. Click on this reset mac macro button. Once I've done that, um, on in the top level folder, it will show up as Adam test. I can run it, but well, it doesn't do anything because it's it's an empty macro. If I did something like FLM Adam's first test and save this reset it will show up you don't have to do the reset macro every time that you modify your macro basically yes this first special line if I modified that that was necessary and also if I add something to the folder uh, the macros folder it's necessary but other than that I don't have to do that so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna just be running it here later and writing it here. So let's have a look at what, what's actually Python made of. Well, first of all is strings. So strings are um, uh, pieces of text that are um, surrounded by, by uh, quotation marks, either single quotation marks or double quotation marks. And anything here, like for instance, Adam or Yuri is a string. Now what can I do with a string? I can, well, I can print it, certainly. So I have this little macro. I save it. I don't need to run it in uh, FontLab Studio because I could run it in the regular Python interpreter, which I will do here now just so we build, of course, yes. So yes, so it, the Sublime Text has this neat feature that allows it. It's basically the same thing, you know. In FontLab Studio, we have an edit macro panel and an output window. In Sublime Text, we have this panel down here and uh, the editing text. It's it's the same principle: input output. I'm going to be showing it here because it sort of looks better. So, yeah, I have two print statements: print Adam, print Yuri. I can write something else. For instance, print. Thomas without the quotes and I'm gonna hit I'm gonna run this oh I get some problem here so this is called a traceback this is uh, Python's way of telling me that um, something's not right in my uh, syntax the information here well is you usually the most important thing that you get from here is a line number where Python has found a problem that's line 5 and then uh, the information where what exactly the line was print Thomas and then some kind of an error so here we have the error name error, error name Thomas is not defined well because I haven't surrounded this with quotes then Python expects me to uh, this Thomas to be a kind of an object or a variable so for now I will just surround it with uh, quotes and if I run it now, it runs fine. That's, well, we have three names here. Um, so what if I uh, wanted to, uh, what else, can, what else are literals? So the, these, are, these, are, these are literal strings, but also integers or floating uh, point numbers. So 
integers, fairly easy, something like four, and floating numbers, something like, you know, 3.14. Uh, I can run print, okay, it'll print. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the two most important strings and numbers are the two most important types of literals. What is a literal? Well, literal is, is uh, something like this. It's basically some kind of information that is just given directly uh, to Python Python sort of does something with it and forgets about it. It doesn't really know once you've typed in uh, print Yuri, it has printed Yuri, but then it doesn't really know that it printed Yuri. Uh, sometimes it's useful to assign these literals to something else. Um, and there we use names without quotes. So here with the assi assignment we have this difference. If I say print 23, I'm, I'm going to get print 23. But if I assign some value in using the equal sign, it will basically put that value into a box and put a label on it. So in this particular example, we have x equals 23. Then Python takes the, the value 23 and sort of puts it into a box and puts a label x to it. And then it remembers it. So whenever later, I will refer to x, it will know un until I change it that the value that inside that box is 23. So it's so using that's called a variable or an object uh, that x and that's 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 a very 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 uh, useful thing because for instance you know if I say uh, something like print uh, print hello Adam and then say print Adam is here well, that's easy, but let's say instead of Adam, I wanted to change uh, change it to Yuri, I would have to change it twice. That's not that practical. So what I can do here is make up a name without quotes. That's going to be my, my uh, the label for my um, variable or object person. And I say person equals Adam. And what I can do now is something like this. I'm going to build. Oh cool, the same output. But if I change Adam to Yuri now, it, you know, any time that this object person is mentioned, uh, the contents Yuri is actually used. So this is, this is, this is basically the label. This is what's on the box. This is what's in the box. Here one thing that we've already noticed is, well, I can use the plus sign on strings. Well, let's try that. I, I say print two in quotes, plus three. Okay, what do you think the output will be? Okay, well, let's try. Well, I'm gonna do something else. What's gonna be the second line? Yes. So this is this is the difference. Plus is an operator, and operators in Python are sort of smart. I'm not going to get into the details, but they're kind of smart. Plus for strings means concatenation, gluing the strings together. Plus for numbers means uh, adding them to, together, numerical addition. Um, and that's important, you know, to remember uh, because sometimes we may make mistakes because indeed, what will happen now if I say print string 2 plus number 3? So that's basically, it says type error cannot concatenate string in integer objects. That's basically something that Python doesn't really know what you want to do with this. You know, it, it, there is no reasonable result that everybody would agree on. What's the best thing if you, if you, if you add a string to a number? Um, so so it's, it's important if I really wanted uh, to get 23, but I had the three somewhere let's say, and if I wanted to write your, ah, okay. Oh yeah, that, that's another trick. You know, if, if you actually want to uh, to use the, the single quote, then you can surround your string with double quotes and vice versa. Mm, your, and then I say age plus years old. If I run that, 
I get the again the the, the trace back report that it doesn't know what to do. Well, there's there's a couple of ways to deal with this. One is I can convert this number that is held in the box called age in the variable age into a string using a function. So this is here str and the parentheses, the round uh, the round parentheses. This is a function call which takes this particular object as an argument and when I run it now I get the expected results. So Python comes with a huge number of, of functions and this particular construct, this particular way of, of, of writing is quite, imp quite important in Python because there will be many situations where you will call a function or call a method of an object and then whenever you do that you need to use the round parentheses without a space and then inside you can provide some arguments. One or more, if there will be more, you separate them with commas. We'll have a look at that um, a bit later. So that's that's the that's really the most important um, sort of key points, the basics. And now let's have a look at one more thing, and that's lists. And lists are quite interesting because lists, um, well, with lists you can do uh, some nice things, and they are actually very related to glyphs, so and uh, to fonts and glyphs, uh, because a font is basically a list of glyphs. And let's start before we we do fonts. Let's start with a simple example. Um, I'm going to start a. Uh, I'm going to make up a name. Um, these names again, they can be upper lower case, but they're case sensitive. You know, no special characters, no spaces, just letters and numbers stick to them. This is going to be the label, the name of my variable or object. I'm now assigned to it uh, a list and the list is written using square brackets. In the square brackets I can enumerate um, some values. These can be other objects, these can be strings, this can be uh, numbers, pretty much anything. So in this particular case, I'm going to say first uh, we have Yuri, Jimmy, Adam, Thomas. So this is, um, this is, uh, we have a list now. Uh, well, what can I do with the list? Of course I can print it, which is not superbly spectacular. I'll just pretty much get the same thing, just a list. This is this is a a representation of that list that Python prints me just so I know what's inside. But that's not really super useful. But what I can do is I can also um, tell Python to print a, a particular element of that list. And how do I do that? Well, if I have the object name and the na the object is a list, I can use the square brackets and type in an index. The index, as with many computing things, starts with zero. So if I say print people zero, I get Yuri because this is the element zero. If I write three, I get Thomas. If I write four, well, I get again a traceback. Python tells me list index out of range because that's um, list only has four elements, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, that basically doesn't exist, so it doesn't know what to do with it. If I have a list, well, what else can I do with it? Well, first, um, I can not just access one particular element, like the fourth or the third one, but I can th go through each element. And for that, there is a construct uh, that is called a loop or a for loop. So if I say for um, person in people, and now is an important bit, a colon, and now after the colon, I, um, I type and uh, I hit enter, and well, some editors will actually nicely indent it for me. That's, that can be a tab or a space or two spaces, doesn't matter so much, but that's Python's way of 
structuring your code is through indentation. Some other languages like the Adobe FDK uh, or JavaScript, they use curly brackets, but Python is sort of, many people like Python because it the, the, the code looks cleaner and sort of nicely formatted because it actually uses these indentations uh, using tabs or spaces. Uh, I, I usually just use tabs, it's it's kind of better, but it's, it's just a convention. Uh, now for personing people, I say print person. Now and then I print something like done. Well, okay. Then I'm gonna run it. Ah, it says Yuri done, Jimmy done. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Okay, I need to outdent this, meaning align this last uh, bit to 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 the the first column of text, and I'm gonna run this. Now it's correct. Now I have Yuri, Jimmy, Adam, Thomas, and then done. That's meaning whatever is so that that's a loop here. That's a for loop. That's a construction. There will be others. Uh, that you learn of, but four is one of the important ones. Uh, anything that is in that is indented is part of that for loop. Then anything that is outdented is outside of that, so it's sort of the next step. So what Python does is it creates this list. Then uh, it we have this four person in people, meaning okay, take the people list and then iterate through it, meaning go through every element and assign, you know, do an assignment uh, in steps. So person on the first go becomes Yuri. So it's basically if we go through people, we retrieve the elements of the list and then it's like the first round, it's person equals Yuri and then do something. And person equals Jimmy, do something. And what we do, print. Um, so we could do something like you know, hello plus person. Run it. Very nice. Now, uh, so that's four. Four is a powerful construct because you can do something to a list of many elements. And as I said, fonts are a list of glyphs. So just to become more practical, I'm going to write a particular statement that so from f uppercase fl import star i'm going not i'm not going to explain it right now why it is so but let's 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 stick with it what i will do is instead of people i will say glyphs and now call an object and uh, there is a special object in fontlab studio called fl.font that's the current open font and that object has certain additional properties such as glyphs so I have uh, fl.font.glyphs and then I say for glyph in glyphs print hello glyph.name okay I'm gonna run it here ah it says no module named fl okay that's important because you know if I run this script inside of my sublime text that's not gonna work because sublime text or the other text editors no Python, but they don't have access to special objects that are inside of FontLab. So I need to run run this macro inside of FontLab, FontLab Studio. So I'm going to switch to FontLab Studio. Uh, I can close this macro, actually, uh, this edit macro panel. And here, Adam's first test, I'm hitting start. And well, it goes quickly through my fairly large font and enumerates all the glyphs. That's pretty cool. Now, Python within FontLab Studio, as I said, has a special API, a set of, set of modules that allow you to access fonts. Um, there is um, the FontLab Studio Users Manual that uh, the chapter 12 that of the PDF is, you know, rec I recommend to have a look at it. So it's, um, yeah, macro programming it is called. And there is some extra information about um, how to work with the macro panel, etc. But also uh, there is a, a list of the most important objects, special objects and methods that are accessible in FontLab, uh, in FontLab Studio. Now there is also the so-called unofficial FontLab API reference. That's a web page that uh, will 
give you um, the information about how these special objects are called. So for instance what I've done is well uh, there is the font lab module, module uh, you is the main module and there you call the object inside it using the fl prefix so the fl prefix anything that follows it after a dot there's special special properties such as font which is the currently active font so that's what i used here fl font in order to make it sort of even more readable i would do something like this i would say that's the way i code is because font is so often used i usually assign it to the variable called f so f is my current font and then i can assign assign uh, to my variable glyphs an object that is f.glyphs now this is because fl font is of type font and the type of the object font has glyphs, a list of glyph objects. Now again, anything that is part of that array or list is of type glyph uh, written in uppercase. So if I go through, through, through this, I could actually, I'm going to change this a bit. I'm taking the FL font, the currently open font, assign it to F. Then I'm taking, I'm accessing the list of all glyphs inside of the currently open font and assign it to a variable or object called GS. And now I use the for construct to say for G in GS. Since GS is a list of font lab glyphs, every time I go through this, G becomes an object of the type glyph and has special attributes such as the one I accessed here name so name is a string it will give me the glyph name g dot name is a string is of type string I can do certain things that I can do in Python with all strings we've gone f for and now I'm gonna do if the other sort of interesting uh, construct We've seen that the output is, is long and, well, sometimes I might want to find some particular glyph, right? Some, something that has some pro property. For instance, uh, I see that in this font, in Source Sans Pro, there are some old style figures. For instance, right, right here, these are, these are onum. They have the suffix onum and I want to do something with them. Uh, so first I need to find them, I need to access them. I will uh, do some tests and uh, the test it will be if uh, in quotes dot onum in g dot name print g dot name okay so I've changed my my macro here and I'm gonna clear the output panel run it again and here aha now I get a much shorter list or much shorter, much shorter output, sorry, because um, the output uh, is first, I'm going through the list of all glyphs, and then I'm doing, that's the for loop, and then the other is the if statement, which allows me to uh, do some checking. We'll sort of show you the basics of if, because it's th there is one confusing thing in, about if. So let's say I have something like age equals 39 if age is larger than 39 print okay I'm gonna run this now okay I nothing got printed because I've made a condition if age is larger than 39 it would print something well it's equal to 39 so it didn't print anything what I could do is I could uh, supplement it with a second part else now I have an if else statement I'm gonna run it ah you're still young because it's not larger than 39 if I type 30 run it still young if I type 80 oh you're old right or even 40 so what we have here this particular bit is a is a condition so conditions in Python uh, are all kinds of checks 
which return in the end the logical value true or false. They can also be, be combined so I can do something like and uh, something else happens if age is larger than 39 in parentheses and or or if I change this particular to larger or equal 39 well then I'm getting or you're old if I'm if I'm changing it back to larger you're still young right because it's either larger or larger or equal if I want to check if some if something is equal something else then I need to to use two equal signs that's important that's basically the tricky bit that's where some people make mistakes basically if I type in something like this I run it ah, bad if I type it ah congrats okay so that condition has been met if I do this here then I'll get a, a problem because basically one equal sign means assignment you know take this and put it in a box and label it two equal signs means is it equal to that to that other thing that was sort of ifs else and I will explore a bit what can the glyph object do well among others it has the uh, mark property so instead of just printing out this list I could actually get this information uh, here right here on on my screen in my glyph window in in order uh, for that I would need to change my code so okay take the font iterate over glyphs every t go through every single glyph object perform this test if onum okay so I didn't use equal or greater than but actually here in my if if statement I I'm checking whether a particular string is in another string this is the string glyph name every time retrieved by for every glyph and in means is this string in another string if that's true do something well what I want to do I actually instead of printing the glyph name I can do something like g dot mark the glyph that is currently in question equals well let's say 10 these are numbers that stand for colors print done and I need as the last step I can actually remove that print done but I need to do something a sort of a magical line that's fl dot update font fl dot i font that's just required so that f the user interface of font lab studio gets updated that's sort of useful to have you know this as a sort of magical line at the beginning in this as a magical line at the end okay let's do that run it aha so now I got the mark property the one that you know you normally can access here through just a, a, f a few presets and also custom oh here I have mark value that's actually cool I can go here I can check the number that I want oh, let's say I want this color that's gonna be 150 I take this this value this is the same value that is represented here so if I run this it becomes blue um, so this is basically you know this is already a kind of a useful little macro that is reporting to me you know something um, something particular so now the next steps would essentially be exploring the the space of the different kinds of objects uh, and we're gonna stick to to this reporting and let's have a look at what else the uh, the objects in font lab can do well, for instance the glyph object which is probably the more the most uh, interesting one um, it has a bunch of different properties or attributes sorry attributes are values where you can set a value or read a value so basically they're kind of like drawers you know if you imagine uh, this box that I, I talked about instead of the box it would be actually a whole um, wardrobe and inside there would be little drawers and each of the drawer would have its own label 
and there you could put something and retrieve something. And of course, these labels would be, these these drawers would be dedicated. So, for instance, one little drawer in that wardrobe that would be a glyph object is name, and in that uh, it's labeled name, and inside is stored the name of the glyph. Then there are others such as mark the color uh, the, the the color mark. Then there are many others such as lists of other lists of objects. So for instance inside as just as a font is a list of glyphs, a glyph is a list of nodes or outline points but also has a list of uh, hints, of anchors, of vertical guides, horizontal guides and they're all kind of they work in a very similar way so once you've got your, your once you understood how lists work and how um, how accessing these single elements works, uh, that's fairly that's fairly fairly uh, fairly easy. So uh, let's oh one important for instance could be components. Components is a list of uh, of components in a glyph. So you as you know we may have components component glyphs, but it also has normal outline glyphs, right? So let's imagine I want to actually mark all my components glyphs uh, and now um, I'll go through my glyphs but instead of checking the name I will do a different test I will say if okay so I said g dot or glyph this is currently the glyph object stored under g every time over the iteration the next one has and I can look it up here it has an attribute called components and it's a list of components so I can take this name here and say g dot components well yeah but what do I want to actually check well uh, I actually want to check that that's the, the the good question you know what's the difference between that's sort of going from from kind of the human understanding to a computer understanding for us you can say well this one is a comp composite glyph this one isn't. But how do I express this to the computer? Well, there are a couple of ways. First of all, we need to understand how this data is stored in FontLab Studio. Well, in FontLab Studio, if a component, if a glyph has outlines, it has a list of nodes that is not empty, that basically has some elements in it. If it's a composite glyph, it doesn't have any nodes but it has a list of composite the components that is not empty meaning this particular glyph which doesn't have any components will have a, an attribute called components but it will be an empty list so in other words the length of that list will be zero while this particular glyph has two components so the length of the list of the components uh, attribute will be two, and that's what I'm going to check. So I will check. I will use the len function. So if I have a list, the len function will tell me how many elements does it have. Uh, and well, actually, let's let's do it quickly, even simpler. Print g dot name, uh, comma len g dot components right I'm gonna run this clear this run this ah okay very nice I'm actually getting output you know all the glyph names and the, the number of components that's also remotely useful sometimes but if if it tells me that you know now I actually want the glyphs that have components and not outlines so I'm gonna do if len g components larger than zero uh, well mark the font mark, mark the glyph uh, so g dot mark equals well, this time I'm gonna do 30 or something save clear I'll close that one run aha all my component glyphs got marked and all the ones with outlines didn't um, now you may remember that actually FontLab allows you to uh, mix 
outline glyphs and components, which is not really permitted in um, true type or uh, and that can lead you sometimes to certain problems. So I'm going to simulate this by saying decompose. So I have one com component and one outline portion. So now set the mark to none and I'm going to make even a sort of a bigger um, test. I'm going to check if len of nodes is larger than zero and len of components is larger than zero. So what I'm checking here now, well, a glyph that has a positive number of nodes and a positive number of components, meaning it has both. Okay, so I'm saving it. Running. Aha! Uh -huh. Ah, actually, there were already such glyphs in the font. So I will most likely need to do something with them. That's a source VFB. So there, there was, th and that's actually, you know, that, that's that's a that's a fairly simple test but um, a very useful functionality. There's a number of, of, of free scripts uh, and I've, I've included a selection included, including sort of the, 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 the most recent ones. So Freemix tools by Tim Ahrens and also Remix, font remix tools. You probably, many of you probably know this. This is very complex Python so it's not really about programming, it's just about using it. It's very cool. It comes with the simplest possible installer. You know, you just uh, unzip, uh, double click on this special uh, file, uninstall installer.flw. It will launch FontLab Studio, guide you through the process, and you'll be done. Very easy. So I'm not going to bother uh, talking about this. But uh, I want to have a look at Font QA. Font QA is actually pretty pretty useful. Very easy download. Uh, after I've downloaded it, here's the installation is, is, is a tiny bit tr tricky or at least this is where you know we, we need to have a look. Basically after you've unzipped you get the FontLab folder macros and here you get two portions. So it's not that complicated, it's basically we need to navigate to our macros system modules folder and copy the contents of these, I already done that, into that folder. That's the one step and then sort of what I've unzipped here, oh yeah, and font QA, I can take the font QA folder and copy it directly into my macros folder. But how do I get these macros first? Well, if you go to the to the blog post, um, or what I did is just just go through GitHub. Here, for instance, if I go to the FontLab scripts by Pablo and also the batch font info by Retype, GitHub will open. Here I can browse the source code, but there is also always on GitHub there is a link called Download Zip, and that's what you need to to click. I click this one, I get the Impalari font, font lab macros, I get this, I'll get the retype batch font info. It uses Robofab, which is an important extension, which gives you a different, a sort of more modern way to access font objects insta, inside of FontLab. There is a robofab.org website, which has some very nice uh, getting examples, step-by-step uh, -step intro, and it it guides you through um, through doing doing things. So this is this is a great read. It it has nice examples, and basically the Robofab uh, website is is great. And basically Robofab works the same or almost the same way in FontUp Studio, uh, Robofont glyphs and even to some extent I believe FontForge. So if you um, if you learn to write the macros using Robofond, uh, Robofab it really doesn't matter so much um, which editor you're using. This is um, so this is for entire families you basically you would need to fill out all the information for instance you know 
family and then descender ascender descender um, win ascent etc it would do it would set these values for all the fonts in the family but it's it's nice to just have a look at how it's done it's um, this is the most important bit basically you know we have some object called font info it has certain attributes family name ascender descender etc we have assigned some values into the dialog box uh, here and we already know this construct for font in all fonts that is a loop that goes through all fonts in uh, open currently and does something uh, to it I really recommend the macros written by Pablo Impalari add, adding a guideline to the center of the current glyph this is not complicated at all we have the same code here F is the current font assign the current font to F assign the current glyph to G uh, clear old local vertical guidelines so the G object has V guides is the the list of guides I'm assigning it to an object running or calling the method that's that's a new thing calling a method called clean so an object just as a function such as len or str would return uh, would 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 transform your um, one bit of data into another form or or maybe measure something and return some value methods are um, are kind of like functions or within an object so if an object such as guides or glyph etc it may have attributes that you can write to and read from such as name but it can also have methods which are such as generate names which is basically you call them so uh, they're addressed by using the the name of the object dot and then the name of the method and parentheses either empty parentheses or some additional uh, parameters such as here we have the next one central is the variable name we take the width attribute of the glyph object divided by two and now we take the glyph object we take the vertical guides list and we append to it using a call at the append method and the append method takes an attribute the attribute creates a guide uh, a special font lab guide and that creation of the guide takes central meaning the width of uh, the, the half of the width of the character as its uh, parameter the guide object right here in the constructor section you can say we can create a new guide or we can create an, a guide that is a copy of another guide or we can create a guide and give its position mm, guidelines center of current glyph I get a new glyph of course now since we know a bit of Python instead of going you know this way and doing it for every single glyph um, manually we can modify this script easily what I'm gonna do is update font here and I'll do current glyph but this particular operation what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna indent it and instead of saying current glyph I'm gonna say 4g in f glyphs right so now I have uh, modified my macro and when I uh, I'm gonna open yeah let's take I'm gonna reload and here I have top level this is my test macro I'm run it and the glyphs the guidelines are generated in all the glyphs and this is this is sort of the last bit that I wanted to talk about is functions you know sometimes if you're um, 
your code is longer and sort of starts to look messy, it's better to to kind of encapsulate, again, put bits of code into a box that has a name. And that's what we're going to do now. So instead of calling this code right here in a loop directly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, function, no, sorry, def um, add v guide at middle and this function will take g a glyph as a parameter and now the nice thing about this is that I could easily do it like this so I could uh, this is basically this defines this oh sorry I forgot about the colon at the end that's important so I need I do define and let's try it yeah it worked well it didn't really I can check yes it it, it works so it it uh, it performs you know several steps I have put this little bit of the code into a box and I have defined the name of that box, that's a function, and a way to communicate from the outside with the box. So basically this is a box which has sort of a little hole and that hole accepts the glyph and does something and I don't really care anymore. That's the, what it does because that's sort of that's done and I can then later refer it very simply and whether I do it you know for all the glyphs or maybe I can just do it very qu quickly such as this fl.glyph and uh, I don't have to rewrite my code every time uh, if I use functions. So functions is a bit more you know, is, is a way to organize your code better then later there are things like objects, classes, and also modules. Modules are more advanced. It's basically when you want to have your code is so large that it actually needs or would use several files to store it, or you would have one particular code that would be written in, would have the smartness, the algorithm, and then you would have several macros. One would be for to do it, to run it for all the glyphs, another for all the fonts, etc. So that's sort of my conclusions here. You know, go through the macros that come with FontLab, download the free ones. I'm going to publish the blog post with the links. Uh, the Python website has some good tutorials. Uh, please watch these videos that will be linked. Uh, they're really good. Check the documentation and, well, write macros ideally in an external font editor, not necessarily in the macros. Uh, uh, macros edit macros panel because it's really very simple and not uh, so comfortable having something like text strangler is much more comfortable so and also yeah the best w the best place to ask questions would be um, about this would be the font lab uh, board the the python scripting board on the font lab forum i'm going to be looking into it uh, in also my colleagues if you have any any questions please post there and I'll try to answer them and well um, hopefully that uh, was useful to you and uh, um, oh and by the way of course I will mention that FontLab 6 will um, also support the Robofab uh, scripting interface so and hopefully also will be very much compatible to also the older macros that were written for FontLab Studio 5. Uh, so yeah, so anything that you've learned here or will learn with FontLab Studio 5, I would say 80 or 90% of it will be uh, applicable or usable also with a different font editor, including FontLab, Studio, uh, FontLab 6. Uh, okay, so um, thanks a lot for listening to me and uh, well, I'm looking forward to your, you know, experiments with scripting. Thanks a lot and bye-bye uh, guys.